Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. A group of Vermonters is working to clean up and restore St. Albans Bay and they're putting together an upcoming day-long event to raise awareness of water quality issues and more. The event is called Take a Stake in the Lake. It's coordinated by the St. Albans Area Watershed Alliance which supports weed harvesting and algae remediation in the bay. On Saturday, June 9th, the Alliance's day-long event will include a host of family activities and a clean water fair to learn lake-friendly living. It's a public event that is designed to get what I like to say mere mortals engaged in understanding what we do on the land and how it affects water quality. And it's a multi-part event for families. It starts in the morning with a 5K fun run or walk, and then there's going to be children's games and a uh, clean water festival. We have 15 organizations coming and each one will bring a tip or tips of what we can do to help protect or improve water quality entering the lake, either into the tributaries or into Lake Champlain itself. This event is led by the St. Albans Area Watershed Association, SAWA, and even Extension and Lake Champlain Sea Granite. But there are at least 15 other organizations coming to be part of the event uh, to share their message, which is collectively we have similar messages, but everybody has a little bit of different take and a different message uh, for that. But in terms of who can participate in taking a stake in the lake, that is everyone. Uh, we like to say it's the, the all in approach that the, the nonprofits and state agencies and beyond have uh, taken. And so this is a way to bring every single person understanding what it is they can do uh, to help improve water quality or protect water quality. It is going to take time, but it also took time to get here. And if we don't start somewhere, it's only going to continue to get worse. So why not start now? And uh, baby steps, we're going to get there. With every little thing that we do, we get one step closer to improving the quality or protecting the quality later on. So yes, it will take time, and people shouldn't expect that we're going to turn things around in one year, but everything we can do to minimize the stormwater runoff to the lake, to minimize the nutrients getting to the lake, and each of us has a role in that, that can help improve water quality over time and to make things better for the next generation and the generation after that. For more information on the Take a Stake in the Lake event, which is Saturday, June 9th, check the website on your screen, saawavt.org. You can also call the number, which is 802 238-9319. Research is underway by scientists on both sides of Lake Champlain to understand more about a potential threat to humans and aquatic life. Scientists at SUNY Plattsburgh and the UVMC grant have joined together to study a growing problem that's already well documented in the world's oceans. Across the fences, Rebecca Gollin has the story. There's a mystery in Lake Champlain. Is it a film? Is it a bead? Is it a fiber, fragment, foam? It is tiny pieces of plastic that researchers started noticing in the early 2000s, first in ocean waters and later in the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain. These particles are less than five millimeters in size. That's smaller than a pencil eraser. The first project and probably the longest running was the wastewater treatment plant processing. So Danielle um, Garneau is a professor of environmental longest, science at SUNY Plattsburgh. She's leading a study investigating the distribution of the plastic particles, or microplastics, around the lake, both in the water and also in the animals who live here. We've got invertebrates, uh, macroinvertebrates, we've got 14 species of fish and our top predator would be the cormorants. Um, and so these are all the lake species we've worked with, about 19 species, 14 species specifically are, are fish. The research started several years ago, testing water that was treated at the local wastewater treatment facility. We started doing uh, wastewater treatment plant surveys at the Plattsburgh City Plant. Um, we basically will go out with a 355 micron um, sieve and we'll place it under um, a hose that's pulling water from the last um, portion of processing at a plant right before it goes out into the lake. The study recently expanded from Plattsburgh to include wastewater treatment plants in Burlington and St. Albans, with Garneau's team taking samples weekly at each location, as well as several sites within the lake. 
As you can see from these pie charts, we're getting a lot of fragments. So that's in orange here. Um, and this is 2015 and 16 samples. One concern is that accumulation of the microplastics in larger fish and predators will have a negative impact on their health. A lot of these plastics have plasticizers and other um, additional you know, additives, the BPA, um, and so on. And those things, are they, are they leaching out into the other tissues, making it through the bloodstream um, and impacting you know, neurologically? And again, findings, early findings in, in many organisms are showing some signs that these aren't necessarily a healthy thing for these organisms. Another piece of the puzzle is determining exactly what kind of plastic each tiny particle came from in the first place. There's so many thousands of kinds of plastics uh, that are out there, different polymers, different types of plastics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the meander is really that, that S shape yeah. that, that rivers are going to create. Slowing Chris Stepanuk is a professor so and researcher at the are, University are, of Vermont. She's the part of the Lake Champlain Sea Grant, which is funding Garneau's research on microplastics. What Danielle is finding is that the dominant kind of plastics or microplastics in the lake are fibers. So those are coming from textiles, maybe like our fleece jackets, or from ropes or other uh, plastic materials that are used in the lake or fishing or something like that. Um, and then we also know that she's looking at wastewater treatment plant outfalls and that these microplastics are making their way through the wastewater treatment plants and out into the lake. Garneau's team is also going back to older lake water samples to figure out exactly when the different microplastics started showing up. Knowing the time frame will help them identify where some of the particles are coming from. One source researchers have pinpointed is washing machines. One of the things that we've learned through different research studies is that different kinds of materials, and this is again the fibers being the most prevalent in Lake Champlain, um, when they're washed, they're shedding off pieces of, of plastic, uh, and that's getting again through the wastewater treatment system and out into the lake. The wastewater treatment facilities are not doing anything wrong. They're simply not set up to deal with such small particles. And while a few fibers getting free during a wash may not seem like a big deal, studies have shown that an average size load of polyester cotton blend could release an estimated 137,000 fibers. Acrylic material, one of the worst offenders, can shed over 700,000 of the microscopic plastic fibers per load. You know, even though when we look at our sieve, when we pull it, it doesn't seem like a lot. You can imagine when we, you know, extrapolate out to, based on flow rates and many thinking about other plants that would be contributing as well, um, this, may, this may become a, a larger problem in the lake. So what can we do? So what we can do is a few things. One is thinking about using fewer plastics. So what kinds of, of action might we have in our lives that uses plastic? Uh, we go to the grocery store. Maybe we don't use the plastic bags. Um, those are films, uh, which would be called plastic microplastic films of a plastic bag bag breaks apart. Uh, she's not seeing those in huge numbers, uh, but that's still an action we can take. There are some products hitting the market that address the problem, like Patagonia's Guppy Friend washing bag and the Cora Ball from the Vermont-based Rosalia project. Long-term solutions could include working with washing machine manufacturers and retrofitting wastewater treatment plants to capture the smaller particles. So in terms of um, what our role can be, you know, just choosing to use um, alternatives or less plastic, you know, don't use the straws, um, switch over to more natural products when we're choosing face wash and toothpaste, you know, be a more aware consumer, that certainly is one of them. Maintenance, maintenance of our um, outerwear and our synthetic clothing, um, and uh, also if, we're, if you um, are out on the lake a lot, you know, making sure that your equipment is up to speed and you're not working with frayed ropes and, and those sorts of things solving a mystery, and rethinking our relationship with the plastic we use and wear. Can we win the war on microplastics? It's going to be challenging. These researchers are up for the challenge and on the case. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollan with Across the Fence.
Thank you, Rebecca. Our final segment today also focuses on Lake Champlain. It involves 50 young Vermonters who are learning by doing in the 4-H Tech Wizards program. Here's Across the Fences, Keith Silva. On the water. Does everybody know about how long Lake Champlain might be? And in the lab. So that you're able to sort of like open the side of the fish. Students from Linden Town School um, are getting up close and hands-on with Lake Champlain. We learned how many different types of organisms are in Lake Champlain and how they work together in the food web. I've been out on a boat before, but nothing really like this. I go out on Lake Crystal and Willoughby and stuff like that, but I've never been out on Lake Champlain. This visit aboard University of Vermont's research vessel, the Melisira, and to UVM's Rubenstein Ooh. Ecosystem Science Laboratory are part of the 4-H Tech Wizards program at Linden Town School. Lindsay Carpenter is the UVM Extension 4-H Tech Wizards coordinator in St. Johnsbury. So 4-H Tech Wizards is a federal grant that the university received about seven years ago. It's uh, supported by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Uh, so it's actually a mentoring program for youth uh, with a focus on giving those youth opportunities for hands-on learning with STEM education. Rub it in your fingers! Besides getting their hands this dirty, really Carpenter sandy. wants to provide students with an experience that lasts. We're hoping that they're, um, they're seeing some new things that they've never saw before or they're seeing it in a different way that might entice their learning and their questions about uh, this, this form of science. Maybe as they you know, pursue their post-secondary plans, they think, well, hey, I did this really cool activity in seventh grade with UVM. I think I want to go um, explore that opportunity. So can you all see something swimming around in there? You can? Yeah. Amelia Karen of Lake Champlain Sea Grant puts the students to work as scientists. We want students to be able to be exposed to lots of different aspects of the STEM fields, um, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So we um, look at not only how can we crunch the numbers, but how can we build the instruments that take those measurements, um, that give us the numbers to crunch. Through the, the lens of experiential learning and science, we then are able to expose them to some of these science topics and give them ideas for their careers as they move on to, to high school and college. Paul Chouquet teaches seventh grade English at Linden Town School. As a part of the lessons he assigns, Chouquet challenges students to think outside the classroom and their school. We've done a lot of career exploration stuff through our PLPs, our personal learning plans. They don't have to leave the state in order to get some of these experiences that they're looking for, whether it's the research, whether it's the, even the mechanical engineer on the boat as far as the, the equipment goes. It shows them that it's available here in Vermont and that it's available through UVM um, or any of the other affiliate colleges. Because we live an hour and a half from Burlington, the kids don't typically get out here to see what's available. Just giving them an opportunity to explore what Vermont has available to us, as well as the really cool features of Vermont, whether it's through the Yakko Lake Aquarium or the lab or, or just some culture stuff. Remember Hannah? She said she'd never been on Lake Champlain. And after this experience, she thinks she could get used to having class outside. I feel like I like being outside in a learning environment than in a classroom. I feel like it's easier to focus. Well, it makes it more interesting to look at. Like in a classroom, you don't really see as much stuff. For Max McClure, being outside means being hands-on. It's better to do hands-on because then you have the experience with it and you can, you know, have, you have more knowledge about it. And I actually get to see it instead of using pictures and images and stuff like that. So it's, it's better to see and actually hands-on activities. The wind kept stripping heat out of the lake. And the Having this experience the gives McClure a glimpse at what he'd like to do in the future. I want to do something with biology when I'm older, so it's really cool to learn about this and have the experience. For McClure, Jewel, and their classmates, this experience is turning out to be a great teacher. On Lake Champlain, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Tech Wizards is supported by the 4-H National Mentoring Program and the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Oh.